This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 2nd, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss a big story coming out of the governor's proposed budget documents that we think others are missing. Second, we explain why we think Governor Dunleavy has just given up on trying to resolve the state's budget problems and violated state statutes in the process. And third, given the state's fiscal outlook, we explain why we think the K-12 industry and many of the state's legislators are being irresponsible. And now, Let's join Michael. I did see a headline right before I left for vacation that basically said, uh, uh, governor's budget is still not enough, which of course we knew was going to happen, but you're going to give us the rundown today. Um, I suppose we should get started um, and uh, and see what uh, what's what with the weekly top three. We're going to start off with uh, um, the story we've all been missing. Brad, go ahead and hit us with number one. Let's get, uh, let's get cranking. Let's just do it, man. Let's just do it. Well, there have been a lot of stories about the budget, mostly about uh, what's in the budget uh, and and some dive into detail of of the various proposals that the budget contains, or in the case of the K through 12 industry, uh, the budget doesn't contain. Um, but I think I think they're missing those stories are missing um, uh, the big picture. I mean, basically, they're focusing on the trees and they're missing the forest. Uh, as a result of uh, of looking at the trees, and here's here's what the forest tells us. There's 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 really two big stories in the budget that haven't been reported yet, and they both have to do with volumes. They ho- both have to do with production volumes. The first story is that for the first three years of the budget, uh, production volumes are down a lot from uh, from what was projected uh, last spring. The story most people have seen is prices are up, so revenues are up, um, and so the supplemental PFD that people have been talking about is going to be fine uh, because prices are up at the level that uh, that that would kick in the supplemental PFD. But what those stories have missed is that volumes are down a lot, um, and as a result, revenues aren't up as much as 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 those who are focusing solely on price think they are. Uh, When the budget was set, it was set, we've talked about this before, but it was set in tranches. It's called, it's been called a waterfall budget because it fills up to a certain level and certain things are covered, fills up to another level and certain things are covered, fills up to a a third level and and the supplemental PFD uh, kicks in. In the, in the, in the spring forecast and in the budget as it was set up, the level at which the supplemental PFD, uh, which could be as much as $500 per PFD, the level at which the supplemental PFD started kicking in was at $73, and it maxed out at the $500 at at $83 a barrel. And the the fall forecast is predicting $83 a barrel. So everybody thinks, okay, everything's fine. The problem is because of of the production drop, the supplemental PFD doesn't start kicking in until about $79 and it fills up slower and doesn't fill up completely until about $90 a barrel. And so we've got people writing stories saying, 
we're going to get the supplemental PFD because the, the prediction is $83 a barrel. We're not, we don't get the full supplemental PFD until volumes hit until, until uh, revenues hit until oil prices hit uh, $90 a barrel. And I think, I think people are just missing that story about what's going on with production volumes. The, the first three years, dramatic drop, uh, really an unexplained drop uh, in the in the revenue forecast. So I think there's some stories, a lot of stories to be written about what's going on uh, with with what's going on with uh, production volumes. And, and, and we'll dig into that in uh, in subsequent uh, subsequent uh, shows. The other the other story, let me get them both out there quickly. The other sure, story, yeah. the other story is after the first three years, there's a couple of years where volumes are production volumes are the same as forecast in the spring forecast. So there's not much change. But after about the fifth year, all of a sudden production volumes take off like crazy in the in the in the revenue forecast. Um, and and it's it they're assuming that Pika hits and that uh, uh, MPRA that uh, that the willow volumes start hitting. Uh, in the latter stages, after about the five-year mark, and and production volumes start taking off, and a lot of people have said, "Oh, yay! Production volumes are taking off. We're saved." Here's here's the interesting, the really interesting thing, and this is going to deserve a lot of attention. Production volumes are up by a lot in those last five years, but get this: petroleum revenues to the state are down, and they keep going down. Um, in those latter five years. So those people who say, like the governor has said, all we need to do is we need to get production volumes up and we're saved. Yeah, that's wrong. Produ uh, revenues are going down. There's a couple of things that are going on with that. One is we're, we're getting a bigger conversion, I think, than, than anticipated from what's called old oil to new oil. New oil doesn't have much tax on it because that was part of, 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 the, of the design of the, uh, of the oil tax re reform in the early 20 teens uh, to incentivize the development of new oil. And so it doesn't have as much tax as old oil. And we're getting a much bigger conversion from old oil, which is called non-GVR oil, for those who want to get into the acronyms, from, not, from old oil to new oil. Um, so production volumes are going up, but, but the amount of old oil is going down, and as a consequence of that, uh, uh, production tax revenues are going down. And, and the you, other, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, and, and, the, and the other thing that's going on out there is that the levels of investment, oil investment, oil industry investment, are much higher than than assumed in the spring revenue forecast, and and so the allowable lease expenditures, which are a deduction from your tax base, um, uh, oil tax, oil tax base. The allowable lease expenditures are going way up uh, in those latter years, driving production revenues down. So, you know, people who, who on this show and elsewhere have said, all we got to do is get Joe Biden to let us produce more oil and we're OK. That's not what's happening. We're producing more oil than we than we forecast by a lot. We're producing a lot more oil in the last five years by a lot. But oil tax revenues, traditional revenues to the state are going down because of because of those two factors. And you've uh, you've highlighted this with a couple of charts, and I know people on the radio can't see them, but you can go look at uh, Brad's uh, article in the Alaska Landmine, his part one article, and it uh, it deals with this and talks about this specifically. Uh, Brad, for a second here, if you want to uh, if you want to lay this out for us here, as you said, the production values all seem like they're going up, 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 all the way out to twenty thirty three, and that seems like good news. Um, if you want to walk us through part of that before I jump sure. to the other chart that shows the uh, actual intake, the revenue. Sure. This is this chart shows the production forecast. The top two lines, the the light blue and the red lines, are uh, the, the the fall 2022 and the spring 2023 uh, revenue forecast. The dark blue line, the line on the bottom in the first three years, is the new revenue forecast, the new production forecast from the fall of 2023, and it shows that reduction that fall. Uh, in in production volumes uh, for the first three years from 24, 25, and 26. And then it shows in 27, 28 uh, that that the lines merge and essentially the two forecasts are forecasting the same volumes. And then from 29 on, it the blue line, the dark blue line goes up dramatically higher than the red line. 
the blue line is from the most recent forecast. The red line is from the uh, uh, the, uh, the spring forecast, and it shows the dramatic jump in production volumes uh, in those in those latter five years. So that's that's the that's the graphic depiction of what the what the numbers are telling us in terms of in terms of production volumes. And then we have the new chart, which, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, comes out here. And this one shows the actual drop in revenues, though, the impact. I mean, that's the thing. Everything in the short term, let me go back to the first chart again. In the short term, uh, it shows production values are lower than they projected by a significant amount, um, almost uh, 10% lower over the next three years. Then it starts to equalize. This is for production and then goes way up. But the bottom line is, is that in the long run, it means we actually am, are going to have less money in these next three years. And nobody seems to be talking about that. Yeah. So so as I said, everybody jumps on the fact that oil prices are up and they and they and they immediately jump from that and say, well, revenues are up. Well, revenues are up some, but they're not anywhere up anywhere near uh, the levels that they would be had production volumes not fallen. On the left hand, uh, the left hand of the chart you've got up now is fiscal year 24, the fiscal year we're in. The blue on the left is the, are the production volumes forecast in the spring revenue that the budget's based on. The red next to it are the production volumes that are now forecast in the fall uh, for uh, fall forecast. And you can see the drop from the from the blue. Uh, what is that? 496 down to 470, a drop of about 30. Uh, a million or 30,000 barrels a day. And then the next two bars, again, FY24, the yellow or the gold is the projected revenue uh, in the in the spring forecast and on which the budget is, is based. The green is now the, the projected revenue at the current oil price, the projected revenue we're going to get out of uh, out of the production volumes that they're now forecasting. And as you can see, there's a drop of $300 million roughly from $3.3 billion to $2.96 billion, a drop of about uh, $330 million, or $330 million uh, between those two forecasts in revenue. And that's all coming because of the way the waterfall is set up, because of the way those tranches are set up, that's all coming out of the supplemental PFD. So essentially what's going on is Alaskans PFDs are going to go down uh, not government revenues, uh, but Alaskans PFDs are going to go down uh, because of the oil volume drop. It's a direct, uh, a direct impact. Uh, the PFDs are, are are taking the direct impact uh, of that volume drop because of the way the budget's set up. So when people, I mean, there's an ADN article that appeared over the weekend, and they said, well, you know, at current forecast prices, uh, the the P, the supplemental PFD should kick in, and we should get the full supplemental PFD wrong. I mean, the, the supplemental PFD right now, as I said, the, the way it's set up in the budget, it could be as much as $500, $500 per PFD. At the current production levels and at the current prices that we're seeing right now in the, in the, in the futures uh, market, uh, the supplemental PFD will be about $190. $190. So um, a 40%, what is that, a, a, you know, 60%, 60% drop in the size of the PFD, supplemental PFD, because of the impact uh, of this production drop. And as I and as I say, that's that's a story that's not getting reported. Right. There's an there's another chart in the article that that then goes on and and does the same thing that we've got for these three years, does the same thing for the full you know 10 year period of the forecast. And you see in the latter years, uh, the blue in that in that subsequent chart, the blue uh, uh, volume production, uh, the, the red volume production that's in the, in the fall forecast goes way above the blue in the, in the latter years, production volumes go up, but revenues keep going down, uh, because, um, uh, because the, the, the petroleum, uh, uh, revenues are going down because production taxes are going down and indeed royalties are going down. Um, it, it's, it, it's really a, it's, it's a phenomena that I think deserves a lot of attention because it's telling us that to the extent that we're that we're assuming that we're going to be okay when all these production volumes kick in in the latter half of the of the decade, uh, that we're going to be okay. That that's a wrong assumption. That 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 
actually things right. are getting things are getting worse and worse. This is some heavy stuff to start off the year with. Uh, and like I said, counterintuitive, when you look at these charts and you're like, oh, things are going to be great, more production, more everything else. But of course, the devil's in the details. And when you realize, even though we may have more production, what kills me is this number here. Let me pull the chart back up here real quick, because what kills me is, is this, uh, this number here. Uh, when you start looking at it and you realize that in 2024, we're projected to have $3.3 billion in revenue uh, by the spring numbers, but 2.96 by the fall numbers. But the worst part is, is that two years out, we're down almost a billion dollars uh, in projected revenue for both uh, for both sides of it. I mean, that's those are some huge, huge numbers. And at some point, the PFD won't even be able to compensate for it. That's the problem. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll talk about that more in the in the in the in the next segment. Uh, but there is, I mean, we've got a we got a huge revenue drop going on, um, notwithstanding the fact that we're having a production increase, forecast production increase in the last half of the ten year period. We've got a huge revenue drop going on, and to foreshadow the next segment a little bit, the governor's not doing anything, is not proposing to do anything about it, um, and I think that's a, I mean, I. I, I ended the article, the, the the last article in the in the landmine, the second look at the budget by, you know, if the governor, why did the governor run for the job? Why did why did Mike Dunleavy run for the job of governor if he's not going to do it? I mean, it's it's he's he's right. He, he, he's he's showing the, the budget and the revenue forecast shows us running in the ditch. And he just his budget just shows running in the ditch. It doesn't show doesn't show a course correction. It doesn't show, you know, a break. It just runs it in the ditch. And, um, and that's, I, I mean, that's a pretty sad state of affairs when the governor's not even trying to, uh, to guide the, the, the car to a, to a safe landing or guide the plane right. to a safe landing. Right. Continuing now, Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, the weekly top three, number two. Now the governor's budget, um, obviously got some ear issues, uh, from Brad's point of view. Also, the question is, did he actually, uh, break the law, break state statute. Brad, give us the rundown here. So the governor's budget um, uh, is, again, a lot of people have focused in on, on the proposals for FY25, and they've focused in on, on the trees of what the governor's proposing and what he's not proposing and all that, and all that debate. But, but I think it's important at the same time you're doing that to back up and look at the forest and see what the overall spend is and, and how that compares to revenues and the deficits that are opening up. Um, and so the second landmine article, the one that we published last Friday uh, on the governor's budget, uh, does that. And it shows huge uh, deficits, um, not only uh, beginning in FY25, but growing all the way out to uh, the FY33, which is, far as the, is as far as the projections grow. And, or go. And as I said, um, a lot of that is because oil prices, even though oil production volumes are going up, oil revenues are coming down because of the conversion from uh, the bigger than anticipated conversion from old oil to new oil and uh, and uh, and the bigger allowable lease expenditures that are coming in. The chart you've got up shows uh, on the left, the left hand bar, but this, these are all fiscal years. Each of the pairs of bars are for fiscal year. And fiscal year 25 on the on the left, uh, the fiscal year that the legislature is going to be dealing with this coming session, the spent the projected spending level projected by the legislative finance division, projected spending levels in green on the left, projected traditional revenues are in dark blue on the right. Uh, the portion of the percent of market value draw that's available for government under statute, the, the, what the current law provides that the, that the POMB going to government is, um, is in uh, yellow or gold. And then the deficit that's showing up uh, is in red. And as you can see, uh, traditional revenues aren't growing by much uh, over, the, over the period. Uh, the percent of market value available for government is staying relatively stable, but spending continues to go up. Now the governor's projection uh, uh, is that spending sort of levels off in these out years. But the first part of our article uh, uh, focuses on on how good the governor's been at projecting spending in his past budgets and <laughs> his past 10-year plans. 
and it's horrible. I mean, basically, the governor projects low spending. The legislature comes in and 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 passes a high budget, and the governor signs it. <laughs> and so, even in the year, even even each fiscal year, when he does a ten-year plan, does a budget and a ten-year plan, each fiscal year he's been as much as twenty to thirty percent below the the spending level yep. that's ultimately been approved by uh, well, by just the for the and just for the radio folks who can't see the chart, I'll just say this is a 10-year plan. In 2025, it says $5.48 billion is the projected budget. And in twenty in 2033, he says 6.64% is the projected budget. That barely makes up for the automatic escalators in because the budget goes up 100, 100, almost $150 million a year. If nothing changes, a bomb went off and the legislature wasn't in session. I mean, it would go up $150 million a year every year. That barely that this barely covers it. He says it only goes to $6.64 billion in a, in an eight year period. That's, uh, you know, that that's just not, uh, I mean, it's, it's not realistic. Well, these are actually the, the projections by the Legislative Finance Division. The governor's numbers are actually even lower, uh, but they're un, but they're unrealistic. I mean, the, the governor's numbers are unrealistic, given the pattern in practice that, that has occurred over the last five years. Maybe if the governor had, you know, in, in over the last five years, had proposed a budget and then stuck with it, vetoed the legislature back down to the governor's proposed level, uh, we might we might be on a much different spending track than than we are. But each time, as I said, the first part of the article is devoted to looking at the pattern and practice over the last five years. Each time the governor's proposed significant spending restraint, uh, the legislature's just run over him like a Mack truck, and the governor signed it at the at the end of the day, assigned it. So there, there's no I mean there's no predictive value in what the governor says the spending levels are going to be anymore. They're just his, you know, it's sort of like politically political signaling to uh, to his base saying, I'm, I, you know, I'm proposing a low budget. I won't back it up when the time comes, but I'm proposing a low budget. Here's here's the here's the other thing that's that's really uh, 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 concerning about what what what's going on with the governor's budget. Here's what Alaska statute says. AS 370720 B2 says this. In addition to the budget and bills submitted under A of this section, and that's the that's the the bills and the budget for the current fiscal year, the governor shall submit a fiscal plan with estimates of significant sources and uses of funds for the succeeding 10 fiscal years. In other words, the 10-year plan. The fiscal plan, the 10-year plan, this is statute, must, must balance sources and uses of funds held while providing for essential state services and protecting the economic stability of the state must balance sources and uses of funds. That means, you know, the sources of funds must balance with the uses of funds. You must, you know, you can't be showing uh, running deficits. You have to have some source of funds to fill in the deficits. For the last decade, we've used, we use savings. That was the source of funds that filled in, that balanced the budget. For the last few years, uh, the governor's proposed various things uh, when he submitted a budget. Last year, we were going to have the carbon credits that were going to save us, and you know we're going to have billions and billions of dollars in carbon credits that we're going to that we're going to balance the budget. Whimsical, but nonetheless, at least the ten-year plan balanced because, as required by statute, because he filled in those revenues uh, to balance the budget. Here, here's the here's the really troubling thing: this year's ten-year plan get you the first three years balanced by filling in the deficits that we showed on the last chart by filling in the deficits withdraws from the constitutional budget reserve. After those three years, the governor gives up. His 10-year plan shows deficits and it doesn't show any source of funds to balance against the uh, to balance against those deficits. There's no savings left. We, he he's drained the CBR. He proposes to drain the CBR the next three years to cover the deficits that, that occur in those years. Um, there's no CBR left. There's no SBR, no statutory budget reserve. That's long since gone. He doesn't propose using permanent fund earnings as he did in an earlier, uh, in an earlier year uh, to fill in the deficits. He doesn't propose taking the PFD down to PFD or POMB 5050 as he did uh, in an earlier budget. He just, 
He doesn't propose carbon credits. He just gives up. And, and, and so the 10 year plan that is required by statute that it must balance sources and uses of funds. It doesn't show balanced sources and uses of funds. It shows a huge imbalance uh, growing, uh, even at the governor's proposed spending levels, a huge imbalance growing all the way out to the end of the 10-year plan. He hasn't complied with the statute. He's not, he's not even making an effort. His administration is not even making an effort to, uh, to propose additional funds. In prior years, the Department of Revenue would publish what they call a fiscal plan model which would enable users to go look at the fiscal plan model and it had very mo- various modules in it and say this is how I'm going to this is how I would use these modules to balance the budget. Adam Crum's Department of Revenue hasn't published those modules this year. So basically what the governor is saying, yep, we're running huge deficits um, and I don't have a plan. I don't the governor. I don't have a plan for how for how I'm going to balance those out. And I'm not going to give you, Alaskans, the ability to figure out your own plan because my Department of Revenue has is not, is not giving you the modules anymore about how much a sales tax would raise or how much changes in oil taxes would raise or how much other forms of, of various revenue uh, proposals would raise. So we got a governor who's just who, who is telling us the, 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 the car is running off the road. It's running. It, it's running in the ditch. It may be running off the cliff. Um, we got a governor who's telling us that, but who is not giving any proposals, proposed solutions to it. And what's that? What's that leaving exposed? It's the PFD. He t- he tells you he wants a full PFD. He tells you he's proposed a full PFD, but he's not giving you any way, and the Department of Revenue isn't giving you any insight into how to balance the budget in those years that he admits we run off the road, no way to do it other than for assuming PFD cuts. So uh, we, the governor is just, I mean, he's just stopped being governor. After those three years, he just stops being governor. The guy, the, the, the statute says you shall show us how to balance sources of uses of funds. And the Dunleavy administration is saying, Nope, I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. Well, and so, I, 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 and, and so I, there you go. I would argue, even though, I mean, the governor is supposedly, you know, offering this balance, but anytime you offer to balance a budget out of savings, <sighs> it's not truly a balanced budget because that's not, that's not fixing it. Savings is finite. Savings is, there's only so much of it and it's supposed to be there for, and we, by the way, we still owe the CBR like $8 billion, $9 billion. And, and he wants, his proposal is to drain it down. And that's a solution for ba- That's not a balanced budget. I would argue that anytime he's offered that as an option, it's not balanced. Well, under the statute, at least you can make the argument that you're fulfilling the mandate of the statute by, by using savings to fill in, to fill in those cracks. But, but now after the after the three years after fiscal year 25 26 and 27 he's not even showing that i mean because we're out of savings w- what the budget shows is that the cbr hole the cbr deficit becomes bigger and bigger and bigger he's assuming we plug the deficit with money with dollars that aren't there <laughs> by i don't know issuing warrants against future cbr i it's it is it is an, a a complete abdication of his responsibility under the statute to show a balanced budget, to make at least some effort. Right. I mean, last year, you know, the carbon credits, you can question whether that was, that was a serious effort. He's not even trying that anymore. Yeah. He's just, he's just leaving. He's just letting it lay out there. And in combination with Adam Crum, not having the department of revenue show the module, show the options. If we, if we change oil taxes, if we if we if we had a sales and use tax like Ben Carpenter's proposed, not even showing those options out there, he's just I mean he's just telling Alaskans, well, too bad, <laughs> but I don't have a plan for it. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, here, hold this, uh, hold my beer, watch this. I'm gonna go step out here and do something else. I mean, lame duck. He's the lamest of lame ducks, says Chris. I mean, that's you know, I mean, I think we're all in agreement here. The governor has basically the governor has one foot out the door. Um, you know, that it's, I mean, that's, 
it, it's a it's a horrible situation. Um, uh, Richard does ask the question: What can the rest of us do about it? I mean, that's a, I mean, I guess that's the question, right? What can the rest of us do about it? I don't know at this point. I mean, we got the lunatics are in charge of the asylum, and we're just sitting here with a popcorn waiting for the walls to explode. Well, it's the legislature. I mean, the legislature is gonna is gonna be the one that's gonna have to have to deal with this. The governor's given them no plan uh, for uh, from from after three years, no plan forward. Um, he's just, you know, if one were if one were um, conspiratorial about this, you would you would you would look at uh, the the presidential election. And and who the governor is supporting for president, and and what his what his appointment, what what his decision might be, the president, the new president, uh, what his decision might be about who to appoint uh, secretary of interior, and and you might you might want to look at that, and then and then line that up with this ten year plan, and essentially the governor says I'm gone, <laughs> and 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 I don't you know good good luck guys, um, it, it, it's. Uh, what can the rest of us do about it? It's up to the legislature. I mean, the governor's essentially checked out um, and uh, and now left it in the hands of the legislature, and the legislature is going to have to deal with it. But as I'm going to talk about uh, in the in the next segment, the legislature is not being responsible uh, about this either. So it's just I, we're the the train is running off the track. I mean, how many analogies can I come up with? The train is running off the track. The bridge is out. The train is running is running full steam ahead. No, the people we elected, the governor we elected, who has a statutory responsibility to at least try to pro make proposals to balance sources and uses of funds, he's not doing it. He's just walked away. And um, and and so it's going to be up to the legislature to deal with it. And that doesn't give you a whole lot of confidence in in where we're headed. Um, but that's that's where we're being left. And that's the thing. I mean, I've used that analogy for years. We could see that the bridge is out. We know that it, that there's a, a huge problem coming up. And instead of slowly applying the brakes or even throwing the brakes on full steam and possibly derailing the train, our answer seems to be, hold my beer as you shovel more coal into the firebox because it's going to be spectacular, you know, when it, uh, when it gets there. I mean, that just seems to be the answer. And I think a lot of these people are like, <clears throat> I mean, like you said, uh, maybe I'll get appointed. Maybe I'll go outside. Maybe I'll just, you know, I'll get some other golden parachute and we'll watch the state burn so it doesn't really matter. I'm just biding time till I get out of here. Yeah, I, I've never, I, I've watched this stuff for a long time, Michael. I mean, I go back to the Tony Knowles era and have studied the history uh, even before that. I have never seen a 10-year plan. <laughs> I've never seen a proposal that just doesn't try after a certain point. As I said, last year, at least the governor came up with, you know, the carbon credits. That was going to be our, our, our solution. This one doesn't even try uh, after, after three years out. And I, I mean, he doesn't propose spending cuts. He doesn't propose revenues. He doesn't propose PFD. He just doesn't try. And, um, and I, I mean, you can't, as I, as I said in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, break, uh, the last sentence of my of, of last week's article was, "Why did Dunleavy run for governor if he wasn't going to do the job?" Right. I mean, no. it's just he, he he's not. The statute tells you what the job is, the bare minimum, and he's not even doing that. Right. Well, and if you think we're going to look to this legislature to get anything done. I mean, it's an election year. I mean, pretty much everybody's up for re-election in the House and all this. I mean, you think they're going to just, they want to just rubber stamp this thing and get it through and, and move on. I mean, they've got some priorities. You could see it in the headlines, school funding, a ranked choice voting, and defined benefits are going to be the big, you know, things of the day when it comes to that. But I mean, they're not going to, they're not going to move on anything substantive in the, you know, in the, in the, in the intervening uh, session here. Yeah, and here's the point. I mean, this isn't this isn't way the hell out in the future anymore. This is three years from now. We hit we hit this point. It takes time to turn a train. It takes time to slow a train down. It takes time to turn a boat. It takes time to break a car. Whatever analogy you want, it takes time. You have to build these things up over a couple of sessions to to get legislation passed to you know change oil taxes or to institute a sales and use tax like Ben Carpenter's proposed or to or to make huge uh, uh, cuts in spending lot 
that it would take to balance the budget with spending cuts alone. It takes time to do that. And, and this is one of the few sessions we've got to uh before before we hit that point welcome back to it the final segment of hour one the michael duke show first show of the new year we're getting brad keithley in here to give us the rundown of the budget which is who hasn't stolen my happy thought yet but boy it just feels so frustrating i mean the whole question of okay well what can we do about it there's not a lot we can do about it the legislature is kind of in control for this next uh 10 months or so here until the next election cycle um, and in, unless we could change the players out, it's going to be a mess. But the legislature's not going to do anything. They've already shown what their priorities are, Brad. And uh, irresponsibility seems to be the word of the day. So, Michael, Michael. Back, when, back when we first got into this this, this budget back, battle back in the early 20 teens, um, and I started advocating for spending cuts, wrote op eds. We, you and I talked about it on the show. And I started advocating for spending cuts. The, the, the response I would get is, okay, where do you want to cut? And I would have answers to that. Uh, but, you know, nobody really wanted to hear them because they didn't want to make the cuts. Uh, and so as it went, others didn't have answers to that. Others said, well, it's up to the legislature to, to make the cuts. And so there was a period of time when there were a lot of allegations of irresponsibility. Yes, you want to say you, you want to make spending cuts, but but you don't have a plan for where you make the spending cuts or you don't have a, you haven't thought through the implications of making these spending cuts. And so you're being irresponsible was the, was the assertion. We're on the, we're on the flip side of that. Now we've got, we've got people, particularly the K through 12 industry. Um, there was a, a, a an op-ed in the ADM that I picked out uh, to sort of typify this. It was by the, uh, the uh, Anchorage School District Superintendent uh, uh, Bryant uh, it says Dun Dunleavy's budget falls short of what Alaska schools need to succeed, and it's you know 650 words about you know why we need to increase spending for uh, for K through 12 um, and why we need to increase you know defined benefits and all that sort of stuff for uh, for, uh, for or go back to defined benefits uh, for teachers and all that sort of stuff. But here's 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 the flip side of what people were asserting in the early 20 teens they're not telling us where the revenue comes from they want increased spending they want to push up all of the well they want to increase current k through 12 increase uh, current k through 12 spending they want to increase uh, uh, compensation to teachers by reinstituting a defined benefits program they want to push up spending elsewhere uh, in the government, other op-eds support pushing up uh, uh, spending elsewhere in the, in the government. But you don't find in any of those, just, just sort of like they claimed that, that you couldn't find in the early 20 teens, you couldn't find any indication of where the spending cuts would, would occur. People would talk about we need spending cuts, but, but you never defined where the spending cuts would occur. Now we've got people pushing for increased spending, but they don't define where the revenue comes from. <clears throat> the implication is if you don't if you don't talk about it coming from someplace else the implication is that it comes from pfd cuts but they don't want to talk about that because they know pfd cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and they have and they are by far the costliest for 80 percent of alaska families they don't want to talk about that because they know that's the worst option and so they don't want to get hung out to dry by advocating what's the worst option. And so they don't they don't talk about revenues at all. And the consequence is we have all these people out there pushing for increased spending. Oh, Johnny needs more money. The teachers need more money. The state needs more money. We need more money for state employees. We need more, we need more state employees because we have all these failures going on. They don't talk about offsetting cuts elsewhere in government because they don't want to, they don't want to trigger those constituencies into into opposing their plan and they don't talk about they don't talk about where the revenues are going to come from so they are being equally as irresponsible about about the path forward that they're pushing for the state as they claimed <clears throat> the hypocrisy and this is big that as as they claim people in the early 20 teens and mid 20 teens were being irresponsible because they pushed for spending cuts without without defining where those spending cuts uh, would come from. And, and 
and, and you can see where this is going. You can see where this irresponsibility is going by just looking at the governor's 10 year plan and seeing that after three years, even under the government governor's proposed spending levels, which will not be the spending levels we end up with because the governor will not back up his own budgets with vetoes and say, this is the, this is the level I'm going to agree to. When the legislature passes more, the governor just signs more. Uh, you can see where this is going at the end of three years, under the, even under the government governor's proposed spending, we're done. We've drained the CBR. We've drained the SBR. We got nothing left. We're done. And so we got, we got all these red numbers that go on out for the rest of the 10 year period. There's nothing. I mean, the governor says, oh, well, we need more oil production. Well, <laughs> the governor's, the governor's revenue forecast tells us that even with the more oil production that they're, that they're projecting, oil revenues, traditional revenues are going down because, because of how the, because of how the, the oil tax uh, operates and the and the shift in the unanticipated or the the bigger than anticipated shift in volumes from old oil to uh, to to new oil to the lower tax new oil. Nobody's got nobody's got a solution out there for for what the for what the revenues are, and yet we have people pushing in op eds and elsewhere saying, "Oh, but we've got to have more spending." Where are the revenues coming from? I don't want to talk about that. We got to have more spending. And, and the irresponsibility of pushing that train, feeding more and more and more coal into the engine, to use, your, to use your train analogy, as we approach the bridge that's out, the irresponsibility of that is just, is just astounding. I mean, we, we are running this state in, off, the, off the cliff, um, and, and we got people who, in the case of the governor, who has no proposal for what to do about it, in the case of the, the the superintendent of ASD, just wants to feed more coal to the engine. Don't I don't care where the revenue revenues will solve themselves. I just I just want more coal in the engine. I want more spending going on. And and we've got a state that's that's out of control is probably is probably the right statement to make because we don't have a governor anymore who is putting a brake on it or who's standing up. Uh, for for what he says he's doing in his budgets, uh, and who who is out of ideas for how to deal or out of uh, proposals that he will make uh, for how to deal with it. I, I tell you, the, the one person that looks good in this situation is Ben Carpenter, <laughs> because Ben at least is saying, "Yep, trains out of control. Um, uh, we we're, we want to cut spending. We want to restrain spending. We're not we're not doing that. You can't restrain spending enough to to deal with this situation." Um, and so we've got to put, we've got to deal with it through revenues. Don't want to deal with it through revenues, but we got to deal with it through revenues. At least he's standing up with a proposed solution. The rest of these jokers, I mean, the, the other 59 or so in the legislature aren't. They're just saying, yep, out of control, uh, spending cuts. What spending cuts? Well, I don't know yet, but spending cuts. Or well, on, the, on the other side, revenues. Well, and even if it's the PFD, again, looking at this in just the three-year projections you're talking about there, once the CBR and the SBR is gone, it's all PFD cuts. I mean, there is no PFD. I mean, when we're talking about a billion and a half dollar deficit, two billion dollar deficit as we go down the road, that, that's all the PFD. And then more. Because nobody's come up with, with substitute revenues. P I mean, the, the irony of this, whoever writes the history of this period is going to have a field day. The irony of this is huge. I mean, PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. We say that we care about the Alaska economy, but we're using the tool that has the largest adverse impact on the economy. PFD cuts take by far or by far the costliest, most costly for 80 percent of Alaska families. We say we care about Alaska families, but we're using the tool that is by far the costliest uh, for Alaska families. And, and people who write the history of this period are going to say, what were these idiots thinking about? I mean, they, they, they are using the very tools, the very tool that hurts them the most. And yet that's the tool they keep using. Yeah. No, again and again and again. That's the thing. I mean, if you, if you want to cut spending, cut spending. But if you want to keep spending, somebody's got to pay for it. And uh, that's going to be you and me down the road, whether it's a full take of the PFD or a tax or eventually 
the PFD and attacks because that's what's coming. That's what we've been talking about the whole time is that is what's coming. Brad Keithley, uh, wrapping it up here. Final thoughts real quick. Well, we've got a heck of a session coming up. As you say, it's an election year. The governor isn't trying. And if the governor doesn't try, the legislature is going to go, wait, we're the ones up for election. Why the hell are we going to try if the governor's not trying? I mean, the statute says he's supposed to try, but he's not doing it. So, you know, we, we're not we're not going to try either. We could see the train wreck coming and, and everybody else is like, oh, no, it'll be totally fine. Pay no attention to it. It'll be totally fine. It'll be tis but a scratch uh, kind of thing. And uh, no, it's a gaping flesh wound and we should do something about it. But, you know, we've been talking about this for years, Brad. Ten years you and I have been going on and on about this. And uh, I mean, what are you going to do? Here's the here's the new piece of it, Michael. Uh, I guess there's a couple of new pieces. But but one of the new pieces, an important new piece is production doesn't get us out of this. I mean, I, I got to tell you, my jaw dropped when I figured out what was going on with petroleum revenues in those out years as production, as production took off, when production took off like that, I thought, well, that the, the, the deficit ought to be closing uh, out there uh, from, from additional petroleum revenues. But when you look at the petroleum, when you go inside the, the, the department, the department of revenues, revenue forecast, and you look at petroleum revenues, they're going down. The only, the only piece of it that's going up is, uh, the property tax on petroleum on petroleum uh, 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 investment because investment's going up, but that's a very minor part of uh, of overall petroleum revenues. Uh, there's three components that make up 90% of petroleum revenues: the corporate in- the the petroleum corporate income tax, uh, uh, royalties, and production taxes. And production taxes are going down so fast. Uh, that it's not even coming close to making up for the moderate increase uh, in royalties and in the uh, and in the petroleum uh, corporate income tax, right. um, and it's just and, and so you know when somebody if somebody gets on this program and says oh the solution here is increased production it's Joe Biden's fault or whoever's fault it is uh, that we're not having increased production but increased production would say that they, no it doesn't. Look at right. your own look at your own revenue forecast. Revenues are going down even in the face of production increases. Well, and this is why we've said uh, you know, for a while now that the holistic approach, which is spending cuts, new oil taxes, new taxes on oil, uh uh, you know, uh, some form of uh, of flat tax or sales tax or revenue tax. Re, you know, read your, it's why it's got to be a holistic thing. It can't just be all or not. It can't just be one thing trying to fix the hole in the boat. I mean, if you get a hole in the boat to use another analogy, you use everything in your power to close that hole. Instead, they're like, oh, we'll just bail it out with the PFD until it's gone or the CBR until it's gone. And then I guess we sink. I guess that's what's going on. Well, and, and that's why Ben Carpenter, I think, you know, it, uh, the historians are going to give credit to Ben Carpenter for trying to, yeah, the, 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 the first step was the, the, the fiscal policy working group, the legislature's fiscal policy working group, their uh, view of a balanced, comprehensive approach, and then Ben Carpenter trying to carry through with it in House Ways and Means. I mean, I, the, most of the opinion pieces now, or most of the reporting now is that that's dead. That uh, the carpenter's proposal of a of a comprehensive plan uh, is dead, and maybe it is. Uh, but uh, but I, Ben's going to get a lot of credit for I think in the from the historians for having tried to deal with the with the problems as they were. Dunleavy's going to get killed. I mean, the history of the Dunleavy administration is going to be. Yep, we we elected you captain, and and you just ran it right into the damn iceberg. I mean, you it was right there in front of you. Even your own forecasts were telling you it was right there in front of you, and you just ran it full speed ahead uh, yeah. right into that iceberg. And he's going to get killed by the historians. Yeah, it's going to be uh, disappointing, to say the least, at this point. that uh, he, he has been disappointing uh, from the beginning. I mean, ever since getting his fingers whacked after that first budget and then getting rid of Donna and everything else, that was, I mean, that was the beginning of the end at that point for any kind of fiscal sanity in this state. And with the walrus running things, doing things his way, 
I just don't see I don't see any changes coming, at least in this session, maybe the next session as well. And at some point down the road, it's going to be too far to turn back. Like you said, it takes a while to turn a ship. You see the iceberg, you got to spin the wheel now, not uh, five feet from the iceberg kind of thing. That's why we have 10 year plans. I mean, that's why the 10 year plan. I, when I read a, when I read a budget, I go to the 10 year plan first, because that's not only got that, that that's got the current year in it, the current plan. Plus it tells you how that plays out. That's why we got 10 year plans to tell you what the icebergs, the, 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 the dangers are that, that are ahead and give you time as you see them out there, give you time to maneuver around them, to set up, to take the time to pass the legislation that, that enables you to, to, to maneuver around them. We've seen them out there. They're getting, and now they're getting closer and closer and closer. And now we're giving up on, on how to deal with them. Now, now we're saying, oops, yep. The iceberg's right ahead. Yeah. I don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> so I'm just going to go plowing right on in it. And, and the K through 12 industry is saying here, here's some more coal. Here's some more, here's some more power to, you know, make sure you really hit that sucker. Hey, don't worry. We're right. unthinkable, right? Don't worry. We're unthinkable. <laughs> Nothing. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Fine. Just fine. Uh, don't worry about it. Well, <sighs> I don't know what we can do, Brad. Again, we're kind of spectators on this ship right now for the for the this upcoming session. At least we could see what's going to happen. But I mean, you know, uh, it's why I've kind of taken this whole. I'm going to talk about this in the next segment. I've kind of taken this whole attitude of all I can do is what I can do in my own family. That's all I can do right now, and hopefully is prepare for the worst and hope for the best. That's all we can do. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Well, that's uh, yeah. Well, we're all on the ship. That's the problem. I mean, we're all, unless unless the plan is to move to Washington or Montana or Wyoming or something, we're all on this ship. And yes, we might get our family all, you know, bundled together and ready to go, but the ship's going to hit the iceberg. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and if we're still on the ship, we're going to be affected by that when it hits. Better prepare a lifeboat is what I'm saying. Better prepare a lifeboat. Uh, all right, uh, Brad. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.